Hi, I'm Olivia Dean and welcome. We're really enjoying bringing lessons to all the primary school students who are watching us on television. And my role is to guide our younger students through their lessons. Coming up in English, we'll listen to a retell of a familiar story and talk about the characters. In maths, we'll learn all about adding and subtracting. And in science, we will take a closer look at changing the way that objects move. Good morning to all the kids out there. It's time for Learning at Home TV. Before we click our brains into learning mode, let's get our bodies awake and our energy levels up. That's important because exercise makes bones nice and strong. It keeps us happy and it helps us to focus. Hi, I'm Jackie Orson from the Gold Coast Suns and I'm inside like all of you. So keeping active is really important to me. And to keep active, I'm gonna teach you a few skills for, with the footy. To start with, we'll put the footy to the side and we'll be lunging forward and bending down and touching the grass. We'll do this on both sides to get both our legs moving. And then we'll add a footy in. So grab the footy, you put it on the ground like this and you'll bend forward and you'll pick it up. Other side, you'll touch it on the ground and you'll do the same thing. And then we'll place the ball on the ground for the next step. We'll pick it up, we'll bounce it with two hands and we'll put the ball back down and we'll go the same on the other side. Bounce, put the ball back down and we'll go again. And we'll go one more time. And that's all I've got for you today. Good luck in learning how to bounce a footy and pick a footy up. Thank you, Jackie. Now let's settle back comfortably and prepare for our first lesson. This morning, you are going to listen to a retell of a familiar story. Here's a clue. This story involves quite a bit of huffing and puffing. Have fun exploring how language is used to describe a character. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah. My friend Laura is here to help me. Hi Laura. Hi Sarah, hi everyone. Today, we are going to retell the story of the Three Little Pigs. The Three Little Pigs is a very well-known traditional tale. The characters in this story are also very well known. Perhaps you know them. Do you remember what a character is? That's right. A character is a person or an animal in a story. There are four main characters in the story of the three little pigs. There are the three little pigs. The title gives that away. But there is also another important character in this story. That's right, the big bad wolf. <laughs> I'm going to use these puppets to retell the story, Laura's going to help me. Here we go. Once upon a time, three little pigs headed off into the world to find a home. The first little pig built a house of straw. The second little pig built a house of sticks. And the third little pig worked hard to build a house of bricks. One day, a big bad wolf came to town. He huffed and he puffed and blew down the house of the first little pig. The first little pig ran to the second little pig's house. Soon the wolf came and he huffed and he puffed and he blew down the house of the second little pig. The first and second little pigs ran and hid in the third little pig's house of bricks. The wolf soon came and he huffed and he puffed and he tried to blow down the house of bricks, but he puffed so hard he fainted. He gave up and went away and the three little pigs lived happily ever after. <laughs> Thanks, Laura, for helping me tell the story of the three little pigs with puppets. That's okay, Sarah. Thanks for having me. 
Bye for now, everyone. Well, it looks like the three little pigs ended up living happily ever after together in the one house after all. I don't think the wolf gets a happy ending though. What kind of character do you think the wolf is? What does he do in this story? Well, he blows down the houses of the first and second little pigs and tries to blow down the house of the third little pig. He wants to eat the little pigs for dinner. This is a problem for our three little pigs. The wolf is not a good character in the story. In the story, the author has used words to tell us about the wolf. The character is not just called the wolf, he is called the big bad wolf. The words big and bad tell us about the kind of character the wolf is and match his actions in the story. Words that describe someone or something have a special name. These words are called adjectives. Authors use adjectives to describe characters in stories. Let's read this sentence together. See if you can find the adjectives used to describe the wolf. Here we go. One day, the big bad wolf came to town. Did you find the adjectives? Well done, you found them. The adjectives in the sentence are big and bad. They describe the wolf and help us to build a picture in our mind of what the wolf is like. Pictures or illustrations in stories also tell us about the characters. It is important that the illustrations match the words that describe the characters in the story. It wouldn't make sense to use the words big and bad to describe the wolf and then have pictures of him looking small and friendly. Let's draw a picture of the wolf to match the adjectives used to describe his character. Big and bad. Right, the wolf is described as big, so I need to draw him taking up most of the page. He has a head with a big mouth. I'm going to draw lots of sharp teeth because he's bad. Now I'm going to draw his eyes. Then I'm going to draw his eyebrows in a frown to show that he's bad. Next, I'm going to draw his big body. He has two arms and two legs. He also has two ears and a big furry tail. There, I've finished drawing the big bad wolf. What do you think? Do you think my drawing matches the adjectives that are used to describe the wolf as big and bad? Now I'm going to write a sentence about my picture. First, I'm going to write who this sentence is about, the wolf. I'm going to use the adjectives big and bad to describe the wolf in my sentence. So I'm going to write the big bad wolf. Now I've told who, I need to write about what happened. What did the big bad wolf do? He came to town. So I will write came to town. I've included details to tell about where he came, to town. That is the end of my sentence. I have put a capital letter at the beginning and a full stop to show that it is the end of my sentence. I've now finished writing my sentence about the big bad wolf. Let's read through my writing together and check that my sentence makes sense. The big bad wolf came to town. Yes, my sentence makes sense and matches my picture of the big bad wolf. Today, we retold the story of the three little pigs using puppets. We talked about characters and the words authors used to describe them, words like big and bad. We learnt that these describing words are called adjectives. Now it's your turn. Think about a character from a book or story. What adjectives would you use to describe that character? Draw a picture of the character and write some words or sentences to describe them. Have a great day. Bye for now.
appears to be time for mathematics. So Monique will be joining us again today and she is going to talk to us about adding and subtracting. Did you know that adding and subtracting are related? Let's learn more. Hi everyone. My name is Monique and today I'm going to be talking about the relationship between addition and subtraction. But before we start, let's remember some things about addition and about subtraction. We know that when we solve addition problems, the parts can be added in any order and the total or whole amount will be the same. Watch while I show you. We are going to make our own addition fact using a clothes hanger and pegs to add the parts in any order. So the addition fact I am going to make is four and one. Four pegs on this side and one peg on this side. I can see there are two parts. Four is one part and one is another part. Four and one makes a total of five. Now I will flip the coat hanger over like this. This is known as a turnaround. One peg on this side and four pegs are on this side. I can see that there are still two parts. One is one part and four is another part. One add four makes five. Did you see that these parts can be added in any order and the total was still the same? It is still five. That does not work for subtraction. It is important to remember that when we subtract, the total changes if you rearrange the parts of the subtraction problem. For example, four take away two is not equal or the same as two take away four. The total is different. That is because in a subtraction, a part is taken away from the whole. It is not just putting the two parts together. Even though addition and subtraction are different, they have a strong relationship to each other. Both have parts and both have a whole. When we are looking at addition and subtraction, we look for the parts and the whole. That is called using our part-part-whole thinking. This type of thinking refers to how numbers can still be split into parts. Look at my part-part-whole map. The top section shows the whole. The two sections on the bottom show the two parts that are added together to make the whole. Although this chart shows two parts, sometimes there are more than two parts in a problem. Using our part-part-whole thinking when we are working with number problems helps us to see the connections between addition and subtraction. Then we know if we should use addition or subtraction to help us to solve. Using our part-part-whole thinking when we are working with number problems helps us to see the connections between addition and subtraction. Then we know if we should use addition or subtraction to help us to solve. When we know both parts and we need to find the total or whole amount, we can use addition to solve the problem. So in the problem 12 boats were in the lake and nine boats were on the sand, how many boats were there? We know there are two parts, the 12 and the nine. We can use addition and add the two parts together to find the whole. Let's watch and see. When both parts in a number problem are known and the whole is unknown, we can use addition to find a solution to the problem. For example, 12 boats were in the lake and 9 boats were on the beach. How many boats were there? We add the two parts together to find the total, 21. So adding the two parts in that problem gave us the solution. 12 add 9 makes 21. Now when the whole is known, one part is known and one part is unknown, we use subtraction to find the part and solve the problem. So in the problem, 15 birds were in the air, some others were on the wall, altogether there are 27 birds, how many birds are on the wall? We know the whole, 
That is the 27 birds altogether. We also know one part, that is the 15 birds that were in the air. We do not know the other part, that is the number of birds sitting on the wall. To find the missing part, we need to take away the part from the whole. This would be take 15 away from 27. That is using subtraction. We could also use addition by using a think addition and count on from 15 adding to 27. Let's watch and see. When the whole and one part is known in a problem, we use subtraction to calculate the unknown part. We could also think addition by adding on from the known part. For example, 15 birds were in the air. Some others were on the wall. Altogether, there are 27 birds. How many birds were on the wall? We could take 15 away from 27 or add 12 more onto 15 to make 27. So in this problem, we know the whole and one part, which means we can use subtraction and take 15 away from 27. Or we could think addition and add from 15 to 27 to find our solution. 27 take away 15 leaves 12. Addition and subtraction knowledge can both be used to solve problems. We can see the part-part whole thinking in what we call a fact triangle. You may have seen one of these before. A fact triangle helps us to work out the related addition and subtraction facts when we have a whole and two parts. Let's watch the fact family triangle together to learn how to use a fact triangle. Addition and subtraction facts can be shown on a triangle. The number that tells how many altogether goes on top of the triangle. The numbers that you add or take away go on the bottom of the triangle. Look at all the facts you can make from this triangle. 8 take away 5 is 3. 5 add 3 is 8. 8 take away 3 is 5. So a fact family triangle is just like a part-part whole model. The whole is at the top of the triangle and the parts are in the bottom corners. We can make two addition number facts and two subtraction number facts from the fact triangle. These facts are called related facts as they are the related addition and the related subtraction facts from the whole and the two parts. Watch and do this one with me. Let's look at this fact family triangle and see what related facts we can make. 14 is the whole and the two parts are 8 and 6. I can join the two parts together and see the addition facts 8 and 6 makes 14 and 6 and 8 makes 14. Then I can take one part away from the whole and see 14 take away 8 leaves 6. I can take the other part away from the whole and see 14 take away 6 leaves 8. And now, if we use our mathematical symbols for addition, subtraction and equals, we have made four related number facts from our fact family triangle. Wow, we have learned so much about how addition and subtraction are related. We have learned how to use part-part whole thinking and when we can use addition or subtraction to solve problems. We have also learned how the fact family triangle is just like a part-part whole model and that it helps us to see the related addition and subtraction facts. Thanks so much for joining me today. You might like to practice making your own fact family triangle and looking at the related addition and subtraction facts. Have fun. Bye for now. It's time now to return to our reading, which is fine by me because that's one of my favourite things to do. 
But did you know that authors use all kinds of tools to make their stories interesting? One of them is alliteration. That's when words begin with the same sound. Check out how it works. Hello. Are you ready for some more tips to help with your reading? Today, I am talking about alliteration. Alliteration is when a series of words begin with the same sound, like Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. That's a bit tricky to say, isn't it? Can you hear that most of the words in that sentence begin with the sound p? Words are made up of sounds. Paying attention to the sounds in words will help you when learning to read. We can practice listening for sounds in words every day. Are you ready? Say the words with me. See if you can hear the beginning sound in these words. Sun. Sat. Sock. Star. Saucepan. Did you hear the beginning sound? That's right, you heard the s sound. Let's try a sentence with a series of words that begin with the same sound. Are you ready? Polly planted poppies in the purple pot. Did you hear the beginning sound in those words? That's right, you heard the p sound. Try using alliteration on your own. Look out for examples in the stories you are reading. See you next time. All right, kids, I have a question for you. What's the fastest moving thing you've ever seen? Was it a racing car or an aircraft? Or was it a speedboat? What sort of shape was it? Was there anything about its shape that helped it go really fast? That's what we're investigating in science today. Here's Annie to talk about changing the way objects move. Hi, I'm Annie. Imagine you are in a throwing competition to see who can throw a ball the furthest. Which one of these balls would you choose? This beach ball is light, so it may not go very far. The basketball is heavy, so it, it might not go very far either. And the tennis ball is smaller and not too heavy, so it will probably go a lot further than the others. Today, we're going to look at the way objects move. Let's start by carefully watching how this piece of paper moves through the air when it's dropped. Did you notice how long it took to fall? Now, I'm going to change the shape of this paper and drop it again. Let's scrunch it up. Do you think there will be any difference in the way it moves now? Let's watch to find out. What did you notice? It was faster. It's the same piece of paper and it still weighs the same, but the shape made a difference to the way it moves. Now this is a bit hard to observe and we may not have started at the exact same height. So we would need a scientific way to test how shape changes the way objects move. Let's investigate this question like scientists. Does the shape of an object affect the way it moves? To answer this question, we're going to do a test, a bit like the one we've just done with the paper. We're going to roll this car down this ramp and measure how far it goes. 
Today, we're going to give it a load to carry. This sheet of cardboard. Let's start the car here and make sure to keep your eye on the car. Let's see how far the car moves. I'll use tape to put a mark where it stopped. Now we'll have another try with the same car on the same ramp and with the same load. But this time, the cardboard has been cut into pieces. And we will tie it down flat. Before I let the car go, why don't you make a prediction? Will the car travel a longer or shorter distance this time? Why do you think that? OK, let's test our predictions. Let's start the car at the same place and see how far it travels. Make sure you keep your eye on the car. Wow, look how much further it travelled compared to the first time. Let's mark that. So, the smaller shaped car travelled further than the larger shaped car. Have we answered our question? Does the shape of an object affect the way it moves? Yes, we now know that shape does affect how objects move. These pieces of tape are in different places, so we have scientific data that shows that shape does make a difference. When the cardboard was low and in smaller pieces, the car travelled a longer distance. Can you think of any ways that scientists design things to move faster through the air? What if we want the air to push on something? Let's see what happens when I blow on this car with my balloon pump. It doesn't move. But if I put the other sheet of cardboard on, It does move. The air can push it along. Can you think of anything that is designed to be pushed by air? Here's one that I thought of. Moving air can push this sailing boat along because it has big, light sails. Now it's time to look back on what we've learnt today. We know that the shape of an object can affect the way it moves. And when we answer a question by doing a test and collecting data, we are working like a scientist. Here's one more thing that air can move. It's called a pinwheel because it's held together by a pin. You might like to try making one with an adult at home. Or you could do a scientific test to see which paper plane you can throw the furthest. Have fun and see you next time. We're back and we have another one of our AFL friends with us to share some movement exercises that will get your bodies ready for the next lot of learning. Have fun and I'll see you all next time. Middle primary kids, your lessons are coming up next. Hey guys, I'm Joe Berry from the Brisbane Lions and I'm stuck at home just like you guys. Here are a few activities that I do to keep hit, uh, fit and healthy during this time. First one, side lunge. What we want to do with this one is lunge to the side and touch the ball on the ground. 
just like this. See how many you can do before your legs blow up. Second one are ground balls. So what we want to do with these is bring our lead leg forward and pick up the ball. It's important that we swap sides and we bounce that ball to make it game-like. And the last one, you might need a partner for this, but uh, it's a ground ball, but you've got to feed it back before you stand up. So I'm going to handball it over to my partner and let him roll a few in. Just like this, pick it up, handball before I stand up. Both sides, again, don't fumble it like that. And do that a few times. That's all from me, guys. Hope you guys get a bit out of this. Um, go Lions.